Good morning and welcome to the third meeting of the COVID-19 Recovery Committee in 2021. The first agenda item this morning is a decision to take item number four on the consideration of evidence heard in private. Are members agreed? Yes. Agreed? Thank you. We are agreed to take agenda item number four in private. Moving on to agenda item number two, this morning we will be taking evidence on the ministerial statement on COVID-19 and subordinate legislation from Michael Matheson, Cabinet Secretary for Net Zero Energy and Transport. The Cabinet Secretary is joined by Professor Jason Leach, National Clinical Director, Penelope Cooper, Director of COVID Coordination, and Graham Fisher, Deputy Director, Scottish Government, Legal Directorate from the Scottish Government. I would like to welcome our witnesses to the meeting who are joining us remotely. The committee will consider regulations that were laid over the summer, which are list listed on the agenda. Cabinet Secretary, would you like to make any opening remarks before we move to questions? Thank you, uh, Convener, and I'm uh, pleased to have the opportunity to appear before the COVID-19 Recovery Committee for the first time to discuss international travel regulations. I was last at the Health and Sport Committee in March, and a lot has changed since then, both in the overall state of the pandemic and in the regulations on international travel, as well as giving evidence today in relation to the specific instruments being considered by the committee. I thought it may be helpful to briefly say something about the context in which they are made. The restrictions on international travel combine a mixture of devolved and reserved responsibilities and an area where, an area where effective four nations working is essential. The regulations are made under the Health Protection, the Health Protection Powers in the Public Health Scotland Act 2008 and are therefore devolved. Uh, but some elements are reserved, including aspects of immigration and aviation policy, and of course, Border Force, which is the main enforcement agency for these regulations, is part of the Home Office. There is regular engagement and dialogue at official level on policy and independent analysis and advice on risk of travel from individual countries is provided by the Joint Biosecurity Centre. The methodology that the assessment, that the assessment is endorsed, uh, used uh, for this process is a process which is endorsed by the four uh, UK Chief Medical Officers. This uh, leads through uh, to a regular Four Nations Ministerial Forum uh, which is the COVID O Committee, where decisions on alignment or divergence can be agreed and managed. The system is designed to limit importation of variants of concern and cases from high risk countries, while allowing us to reduce restrictions on travels where it is safe to do so. The Scottish Government's first priority remains to limit the risk of importation of high-risk variants of concern from international travel, especially those uh, who, with, potential, with the potential to undermine the success of our vaccination programme. At the same time, we want to support safe, our safe restart of international travel. This is in recognition of the fact that these restrictions although we consider them necessary and proportionate to the risk, do have a significant impact on people's ability to uh, see their family and loved ones overseas or to travel for work, study or for holidays. Members will be aware of the UK Government's Global Travel Task Report, which was published in April of this year. Uh, the final review milestone in that report is the 1st of October, and we are in discussions with the UK Government and other devolved administrations about future policy developments in this area. The nature of the global pandemic means that international travel is not without risk, even if you are fully vaccinated or you are going to a green list country. Everyone should continue to think very carefully if they need to travel and make sure they know the rules that apply in the country that they are visiting and on return to Scotland. 
I hope convener, uh, this overview is helpful and I'm happy to respond to any questions that committee members may have. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. If I can turn to questions and if I can ask um, myself, first of all, just a few questions. I welcome the recent QR code for international travel, which has recently been implemented. But I'd like to ask what measures are in place for people that do not have access to the internet or a compatible mobile phone or are digitally excluded? And secondly, in recent weeks, there have been problems with recognition of vaccinations out with the Scottish NHS, such as one vaccination in England and one vaccination in Scotland. I have a constituent who's had two vaccinations in America, but is not recognised by the NHS Scotland to provide him with a vaccination certificate. What discussions have the Scottish Government had with the UK Government or the EU or other international countries regarding mutual recognition of vaccinations for vaccination passports for international travellers? Uh, so, convener, the issue of um, uh, uh, vaccine certification has been taken forward by my colleagues in uh, the Health uh, Directorate within the Scottish Government. The introduction of the QR code, uh, which was introduced this year, was to help to ensure that we make it easier for people who are travelling internationally, uh, where some countries only recognise QR codes, uh, and uh, the provision of a QR code helps to overcome that particular problem. There remains the uh, option of getting a paper copy um, of your vaccination certificate, uh, which you can request uh, through NHS Scotland, uh, and which can be made available to you. So, for those who don't have access uh, to a mobile device to have a QR code, they can have access to a paper version of their uh, vaccination certificate. My understanding is that in that certificate as well, it can also hold a QR code on it. Uh, uh, to be print, which is printed off, uh, which an individual can then uh, provide to uh, staff at checking these at the point when they're entering a country if they're looking for their QR codes. That would be the principal way for someone who doesn't have access to uh, doesn't have access to um, uh, a mobile device. On well, your second point in terms of recognition of uh, uh, different vaccines, um, before I bring in uh, Professor Jason Leach on this particular issue. The approach that we have taken uh, within uh, Scotland and across um, all of the UK is that the vaccines which are recognised are those which have been approved by the, uh, the FDC in the uh, United States and also from the European Medicines Agency, um, on the basis that the data which is available relating to these vaccines is available to our own CMOs in the UK and our own regulatory bodies to be able to assess that information. Um, on your specific cases relating to individuals who have had vaccinations which are not recognised in the UK, I do not know what the specific details are, um, but if you want to provide the specific details, I would be more than happy to ensure that health officials look into that and provide a, a detailed response to you on the matter. But um, it may be that Professor Jason Leach can say a little more about the reasons why uh, certain vaccines uh, that are being used in other parts of the country, uh, other parts of the world, are not recognised within the existing uh, system, which, as I say, is largely down to uh, my understanding and being able to analyse the data associated with the, the different vaccines that are available. Thank you. Can I invite Jason Leach? Morning, convener, and morning, committee. It's nice to see you all again. Mr. Matheson is absolutely correct that the way. For the digitally excluded or those who are struggling with the internet to get a pass is to request the pass. You can do that on the hotline, or you could get somebody to do it for you through the internet, and they could print it off, or you can carry it with you for travel. The QR code is the crucial element of that that you can't get any other way. The second question, I'm afraid, is hugely complex and much more complex than it sounds. There are two layers of this problem. One is unrecognised vaccines, and the UK uses traditionally the WHO list of recognised vaccines, and that's because the WHO can analyse the data. We can analyse the data, just as Mr Matheson says, and that list changes all the time, but that's the list of recognised vaccines that we consider across the UK, across the four UK sets of clinicians, to be adequately evidence-based to give immunity. The second problem is, recognised or unrecognised, the country in which you were vaccinated. 
and therefore the record of that vaccination and its reliability. So if you imagine literally billions of vaccines now given across the world in 200 countries, many of which have no record of your vaccination and don't give you evidence of your vaccination other than your work. Now, that doesn't probably apply to your constituent. So those cases where somebody has come from a country vaccinated by a recognised vaccine and has evidence of that, we're trying to deal with them on a case-by-case -case basis. So they should contact the hotline. If you write to us, we will try and do that for you. Increasingly, and this is a UK-wide challenge, the UK will have bilateral arrangements with other countries. So we already have that for parts of the EU, I think now for Canada and for the US. So there are increasing ways of doing that, but it depends on both countries. So it depends on them recognising our evidence and us recognising their evidence. So it's a hugely complex global problem, which the WHO are helping us to resolve, but I'm afraid it's not quick. Thank you, Professor, Professor Leach. Can I ask Murdo Fraser for your question? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, uh, Cabinet Secretary and colleagues. Just before I come into the substance of my questions, um, I, I wanted to ask a, a process question. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, it looks like you're, you're sitting in your, your ministerial office, which is a few feet away from uh, our committee room. I, is there any particular reason why you're not joining us in the committee room, um, which I think would be, from our, our point of view, uh, a, a better venue and, and give a more helpful exchange, rather than you sitting in your office and contributing via video link? I'm happy to, in the future, if it would, the committee would prefer me to be, uh, appear in person. Um, largely, like most people, I'm trying to uh, minimise the amount of times I'm in different rooms and meeting with different people uh, uh, during the present circumstances, hence the reason why I'm in my office today. So um, I'm more than happy to, to look at appearing before the committee in person in the future. OK, thank, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I think, I think that, that would be helpful, perhaps something we can discuss with your, with your officials uh, separately. Um, can, can just go back to the, the substance of the issue? I want to ask a couple of, of follow-ups to the, the questions that uh, the, the convener asked. Uh, and first of all, she asked about the, uh, the QR code that's now become available. Um, I certainly had constituents who were uh, traveling to France uh, for family reasons and were concerned that this was not going to be available. I understand it's now been made available as of Friday. Uh, last week, but perhaps you can just confirm that. And to the best of your knowledge, Cabinet Secretary, is this now something that's that, that's working well? Have there been any problems with it that you're aware of, or um, is it too early to say? So um, the QR codes were available from Friday the 3rd of September, so last Friday, uh, Mr Fraser. Uh, and as far as I'm aware, uh, they appear to be uh, operating uh, fairly well. I'm not aware of any particular issues with it. Um, uh, 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 given with any new uh, piece of technology that's been used, there's always a the potential for hiccups, but I'm not aware of any, any particular problems which have been identified today. OK, thank you for that. Um, and we do know that these codes were available to uh, residents in uh, England and Wales much earlier. I mean, is there any particular reason why it took Scottish Government so long to, to introduce them compared to other parts of the UK? Uh, so I'm going to ask Professor Leach to deal with this because uh, vaccine certification is a, a matter which health ministers lead on. So, uh, and, and Professor Leach would have been involved in some of the discussions around these matters. But I'll ask him to, uh, to see a bit more about the process and tell within the Scottish Government in taking forward uh, uh, vaccine certification. It was a technical digital problem, which, which isn't a particularly helpful answer, Mr Fraser, but I can get you a more technical version of that. But I think it was the challenge of connecting the vaccination record with the CHI number, which is the individual identification number for each of the citizens of Scotland registered with the GP. That connection was technically more difficult than I am making it sound, and that therefore took a few weeks. In England, that connection was more straightforward. I actually don't know the underlying technical reason for that difference, but that's what we were waiting for. And I should probably put on record that they did it at remarkable pace compared to where they thought they were going to be able to do it. So actually, they got it faster than they thought able. But a more technical answer lies underneath that somewhere that's above my pay grade. Right. 
Okay, thanks, thanks, th thanks very much. And just just one more question, convener. And perhaps this is to Professor Leach because because um, he's he's the expert on uh, on on vaccinations. Um, you asked convener the uh, question about uh, the issue of those who've been vaccinated uh, overseas, for example, and the problems with that. Um, we have another issue uh, closer to home with those who participated in uh, early vaccination trials who didn't get certification. In fact, my colleague uh, Douglas Lumsden, who's a MSP for North East Scotland, is in that category, and he raised this with the First Minister uh, last week in the Chamber. Uh, has that question now been resolved, so those who took part in vaccination trials will be able to get certification? It hasn't been entirely resolved. My understanding is it, it is in the process of being resolved on an individual basis. There aren't huge numbers, but they, they were a fantastic resource to us. So, uh, for lack of a better expression, we owe it to them to resolve it because they helped us get to where we are. So, I am 100% behind it. Now, if you think about the technical difficulty with that, there are, there are layers because the vast majority of the population are in the same system vaccinated by the same system, QR codes available, connected to their GP record. So all of that is resolved. Now we've got this different category who don't have that vaccination recorded in that vaccination system. So that's the bit we need to do. So I think some of them have now had that resolved, but it's having to be done on an individual basis. There aren't, there aren't enormous numbers, so I think that's possible administratively. And if Mr Lumsden isn't done, then we can absolutely look into that. But it's in the process of being resolved. Okay. All right. Thank you. There is a... There is a slightly technical challenge with that group in that we'll need to monitor their immunity over time. So there's a clinical challenge with them, which relates to the rest of us, of course, so when and if they get booster doses. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Can I ask John Mason? Uh, thanks very much, uh, Convener. Um, and it was your own line of questioning that kind of got me thinking a bit, because we've, we've talked about perhaps people from here going overseas, but what about people coming here for COP26? And I'm assuming some of them will be in these complicated categories that Jason Leach talked about, coming, maybe have hang, had a vaccine but no certificate, coming from, let's say, Russia with the Sputnik, which I believe we probably haven't approved. Um, so can you say anything about how that's going to work? So there's been discussions, obviously, at a, uh, uh, between the Scottish Government and the UK Government on plans for uh, COP26, Mr Mason, and, and that includes the public health arrangements and the CMOs have been involved in that discussion. Um, we uh, are at the stage where uh, those plans are now fairly advanced uh, in development, and we are uh, expecting to, or the UK Government are expecting to announce those in more detail publicly next week. Um, setting out the details of what arrangements will be in place uh, for those delegates who are travelling from other countries that, one, haven't been vaccinated, and two, uh, who have been vaccinated, which vaccinations are going to be uh, recognised. So there's been uh, ongoing discussion between the UK government and uh, the UN over this, um, and uh, the Scottish government public health officials have been involved in that matter. Uh, and we're at the point where there will be uh, bespoke arrangements set out for COP delegates. And my understanding is the UK government intend to set that out uh, next week. The other thing I would add in terms of vaccination is that the UK government have made an offer to those delegates uh, who are intending to attend COP26, who have not had access to vaccinations, uh, to be able to have access to uh, uh, the vaccination programme uh, in their own country. Uh, that was a, a, an offer which was being facilitated through the uh, FCDO, uh, which I know a number of countries have taken up uh, that offer. Um, the specific details of uh, who have ta who's taken up, uh, um, I don't have, uh, but the UK government would have that information. Uh, but they have made a, an offer to try and help to support those delegates that are looking to attend to be able to get vaccinated in advance of travelling to COP26. Because I think one of my main concerns on, on that, just to finish on that point, would be that uh, you know dis uh, delegates from poorer countries are not going to be disadvantaged because they're probably the ones who are less likely to have had the vaccine. And I would just seek reassurance that uh, you know every effort will be made to, to treat every delegate fairly and not just advantage the, those from richer countries. Well, I don't have direct control over that. As I say, it's the UK government that are leading on that um, as the host nation. But my understanding is the 
the, the, the vaccination offer which was made by the UK government was specifically to try and help to address the risk of those who uh, are due to travel from uh, poorer nations who don't have access to the vaccination programme to be able to get access to it in advance. Uh, and that's what it was specifically targeted at trying to achieve. Um, but as I say, I don't know the, the full details of the countries that have taken up that offer because it's a programme which has been run by the UK government as a host nation. OK, thanks. And if, if I may ask a more general question about the vaccines, I mean, even within this country, we've got, I think, three main vaccines that people are using. Um, I mean, are we clear about whether these vaccines have no impact on, on transmission of virus, as is being claimed by some, or have some impact or have different impacts between them? And then, you know, linking to the international side of things, uh, are we clear as to some of the vaccines that people might come in with from overseas, is, is that affecting whether or not they can transmit uh, when they come here, even if they've been vaccinated? So, uh, before I bring in Professor Leach specifically on the vaccines, given the clinical nature of that, there are a couple of European countries that have made use of uh, vaccines which are uh, not approved by the European Medicines Agency. Um, as it stands, uh, uh, which uh, uh, which I know has caused some issues um, uh, uh, at a European Union level uh, uh, directly, but I think Professor Leach is probably a better place to give you advice on just the uh, the clinical aspects of the the vaccines that are not on the World Health Organization's list or that have not been approved by the European Medicines Agency or by our own uh, authorities. Uh, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Mr Mason, you, there's a weekly meeting of a broad range of public health advisors, specifically about COP, and uh, I and colleagues are on that, with fundamentally the aim to make COP as safe as possible, from vaccination through to alcohol gel at the SECC and, and everything in between. All, all Blue Zone delegates, that's the inner set of negotiators, which is a huge number of people, will be offered vaccination in their own country before they travel. If they can't do it there, we will do it here for them, but that's not quite as reliable, of course, because it's longer time. So that a vac vaccine has arrived in countries. Now, it's very difficult for us to know how that's being distributed and used and what will be happening. That's a matter for the UK government, but we have done everything we can to vaccinate Blue Zone delegates. There are then two other zones, of course. There's the green zone outside that, and then there's the world leaders, which is a separate entity with entourages and a hundred or more global leaders, all of whom will already be in bubbles and vaccinated, we are certainly hoping. So it's an enormously complex endeavour that we are involved in. To your technical question about vaccines, we know that the three vaccines we have reduce transmission even of Delta. It is not true that it doesn't help with transmission. What it doesn't do is help with transmission as much as its predecessors, unfortunately. So the original virus now feels easy, and alpha a little bit more difficult, but delta changed the game. And it is not as good at stopping transmission of the delta variant. But if you just use, your, if you just use common sense and think of somebody with symptoms, if it reduces those symptoms, you're less likely to cough and splutter in the room you're in just now, for example, if you had the virus but didn't have serious symptoms. So by its very nature, reducing the disease process reduces the nature of the aerosol transmission, but it does not take it to zero. You can still transmit it, even vaccinated. So we have to be cautious, and 30% of people don't know they've got the virus, so therefore that's why we still have the other restrictions of keeping people distanced, of washing your hands and surfaces, of all those other things in place. The second part of your question is about the unrecognised vaccines, and that's hugely difficult because we just don't have the data. They've been given in countries that don't keep the data like we would have, and therefore that, that is therefore more risk. It, it may be they're as good, but it's simply invisible to us. So, so that, that's the problem. So when the regulators look, the exam question is, is this doing this and they say, well, we simply don't know. It's not. It's not a negative. It's a we don't know. Okay. Thanks, Kavina. Thank you. Can I invite Brian Whittle? Uh, thank you, Kavina. Uh, good morning, Cabinet Secretary and Professor Leach and uh, and uh, uh, those helping. Um, 
I want to look at the sort of longer term prospectus, uh, if you like, for uh, international travel and the travel industry. And I think we recognise that tackling COVID is very much a moving feast uh, and we have to be fairly reactive in, 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 in how we approach it. But obviously the travel industry is struggling and is hugely impacted. Um, that whole moving feast and reactive uh, way in which we have to approach COVID unfortunately doesn't work well for business uh, who really need an indication of a route map that allows a degree of essential business planning. I think you would recognise that vague definitions of objectives uh, and indicators is frustrating that business planning. So can I ask some very, very basic questions? You know, uh, Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, what is the definition of uh, a risk-based reopening of international travel? So the uh, primary purpose of uh, the uh, restrictions we have on international travel just now, Mr Whittle, is on the basis of reducing the risk of the importation of variants of concern and, uh, uh, and the importation of virus. Uh, and the advice which we receive on that is through the uh, four CMOs across the UK who have, uh, in considering the evidence from the Joint Biosecurity Security Centre uh, that uh, assess the uh, risk of the virus in countries right across the world, uh, based upon the data that's available and tracking variants of concern, they've developed a methodology that provides a, a risk matrix for different countries on the risk of importing uh, both virus and also importing variants of concern. And that was signed off by the four chief medical officers within the UK. That then informs the decision-making process on the countries that are viewed as being at higher risk or at lower risk. So the traffic light system from green, amber to red, uh, those countries are then rag rated on the basis of the risk assessment that's carried out by the Joint Biosecurity Security Centre using the uh, evidence that they've gathered on the basis of risk of importation of virus and variants of concern. The principal issue and the risk around uh, variants of concern is the danger that they can uh, that they can uh, escape our vaccination programme. Uh, so, for example, there were particular concerns around the, uh, the beta variant, uh, which was, uh, I think, originated in South Africa, um, and the ability of that potentially to escape the immune response, antibody response we had from our vaccination programme uh, here in the UK, uh, and uh, the risk that uh, importation of those variants can have and actually disrupting the uh, vaccination program within the uh, within the UK as a whole so the the risk based approach that we have is one which is informed by the methodology which was developed by the joint biosecurity center and was approved by the four CMOs and it then informs the decision making on the rag rating for international travel in the traffic light system Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I think just following on from that, I think what, what business is very good at and what we've seen um, over the last 18 months is business's ability to adapt um, um, and they're desperate to, to, to know how they can adapt to meet the safety standards which, which you uh, have alluded to there. So it's a sort of a follow-up, if you like, to that. I, I, would, I would ask in, in behalf of the industry, what does safe international travel look like? Do you, do you mean what does safe international travel look like without uh, uh, without the existing restrictions in place? No, I think I think from, from a if I, if I, if I put, it, put it another way, I mean as I said, business is looking for a way in which they can work around the the, the issues that uh, COVID brings. They're looking to government to give them um, an indicator of direction of travel. Um, so it's kind of a, looking long term. Um, where they, where they, where do you expect expect the the, the the travel industry to go and where they, where they'll be in terms of you know when does where does safe travel start to when can they start to open up more if I want of a better expression look I, I think the first thing to say is that nobody wants these international travel restrictions in place for any longer than is necessary um you know we want to see them brought to an end as soon as it is viewed as being safe to do so. The uh, approach that we have just now in terms of a uh, traffic light system which is operating across the 
whole of the UK was actually a system that was um, uh, proposed by some of those within the travel industry, that they thought that would be a more effective means by which we could open up international travel to, uh, in particular, to greenless countries, rather than having a, a, a one-size-fits-all approach and just saying, don't have any international travel. So the actual system we have in place at the moment was designed to try to help to open up international travel. Uh, and, uh, and to some extent, it has, it has uh, achieved some of that, uh, which it possibly wouldn't have happened uh, had we had a more uh, a, a, a scheme which basically just said, don't travel internationally uh, in itself. I think going forward, um, uh, what you will see is a, a greater focus on uh, uh, the, uh, the importance of vaccination. Uh, uh, that's something which is presently being considered as part of the uh, Global Task Force, um, uh, uh, which is being taken forward at a UK level, which we are engaged with as the other, uh, whole, the other nations within the UK are, uh, and looking at the options for moving forward. Um, I think that will have a particular focus on uh, the need for individuals to be vaccinated and to be uh, certified for vaccination. Um, it will also consider what changes might be made to the existing uh, the existing traffic light system, uh, and there will then be discussions at a four nations level on uh, what is the most appropriate route to be taken forward, based upon the clinical advice which we receive, and also the uh, advice we receive from the Joint, Bi Joint Biosecurity Centre. So, um, the timeline for doing some of that is that uh, the final milestone on the UK Global Task Force report is the first of October. So uh, the work that's ongoing just now is to help to inform what uh, future changes could look like. Um, what I can't do is I can't tell you exactly what that will be going forward because we haven't had those detailed discussions and we haven't had the outcome of that process. Uh, but be assured that nobody wants to continue to have international travel restrictions in place for any longer than is necessary. But I do think the future will have a, a significant focus on the need for uh, vaccination and back forward. Thank you, Cash. I suppose the, 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 my last question is, is probably where I, I was trying to get to in some of that strangled route to it was that the, this is a global problem. It's a, it's not just a, a problem for uh, for Scotland or even just the UK. So I, I think I, I want I want to ask is where we are uh, with with uh, interacting with other nations around the world. That, uh, the interoperability of our approach, uh, the compatibility of our approach, and, and in terms of practical steps that we are taking, or the Scottish Government are taking, the UK Government are taking just now to work across the world to, to address this problem. Where are we uh, in that process? Uh, so the principal process for considering these issues and the options for going forward are um, uh, through the Global Task Force, uh, which is looking at uh, what's happening in other parts of the world uh, and the approach they are taking, including within the EU, uh, uh, as to how that will then inform what approach we take going forward. But it's, uh, you know, we, we, we uh, you know, different countries will take different approaches um, to how they want to restrict international travel based upon the advice and information which they it received from their clinical advisors and from those who are assessing risk on international travel. And that's the approach which the Scottish Government and the UK Government um, are, are taking. And the discussions which we're having at a UK level are very much informed by, uh, by what the clinical advice is and also how we can try to help to address some of the concerns which the sector have and be able to open up, while also trying to make sure we minimise the risk of importation of variants of concern. And, you know, I've got no doubt that if if I was uh, appearing before the committee and we had removed all international travel restrictions and then we were finding ourselves that we were struggling as a result of our uh, meeting challenges because of importations of variants of concern, people would say, well, why did you remove those restrictions? So we need to make sure that we take this forward in a, in a, in a safe, uh, uh, managed manner so that we uh, that we don't expose ourselves to variants of concern that could then undermine our existing successful vaccination programme. Thank you. Can I ask Jim Fairley? Thank you, convener, and thank you very much to the panel for uh, coming along this morning. Um, 
just for people's understanding that are actually watching, we're actually talking this morning about international travel. That's what this session today is based on. And a lot of the, re the regulations that, are, that we're speaking about are um, retrospective. So, like so myself as a new member and the convener, actually weren't here when a lot of these regulations were put in place. So my questions are pretty retrospective as well. Um, and one of them in particular is probably going to be aimed more at uh, Jason Leach rather than at yourself, Cabinet Secretary. But I'd like to ask, first of all, where we are in relation to seafarers and oil workers. And I'm going to ask for those two separately because there seems to be different regulations depending on when they're coming back. Uh, I have constituents who are oil workers who are particularly asking the question when they're going to the North Sea, they're going to the Norwegian sector, they're going to one of the safest environments in the world, they're double tested, they're, they're tested before they go out, they're tested when they arrive, they're tested before they come back, and yet they were still required to have a 10-day isolation. Is that still the case? And if it is, why? Uh, and what is the position with seafarers? I do understand that given seafarers could come from multiple parts of the world, that that may be slightly more tricky. But could you give us an update as to what that position is? I have another couple of questions after that as well. Thank you. So, uh, specifically on uh, oil and gas workers working in the, uh, uh, the North Sea uh, and in the Norwegian sector, so they, are, uh, they need to comply with the RAG rating, so uh, on the basis of whether they've come from a red list country or whether they're travelling from a, an amber or travelling uh, from a green list country. So, if they are, uh, if they are travelling from Scotland to, uh, to Norway and they're based here, then it would be the regulations that apply to them in Norway. Uh, then, if they are returning into uh, uh, Scotland directly from Norway, um, it would be based upon where uh, Norway was at that given time on the RAG rating um, uh, as, it, as it stands. What we have done is that there are times when, um, when uh, individuals who are working in the, uh, uh, the oil and gas sector may come into Scotland um, only for a very short period of time in order to go back out into the North Sea. Uh, and at that point, we used to have a system where they were required to take a test uh, package for a test on day two and on day eight. That was changed back in August, uh, 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 following discussions with the oil and gas sector to ensure that they were carrying out uh, regular testing of their staff. And as a result, those who are only in Scotland for a day or two before they return to the North Sea, they no longer have to uh, purchase a, a testing package. So those amendments were made specifically to address some of the concerns which the oil and gas sector had, and that followed discussions with the industry on them providing us with assurance on the testing arrangements which they had for individuals who were, uh, who were uh, working within the oil and gas sector. Similarly, for those who are seafarers, if they are, if they are returning from uh, if they are returning from a red list country, then they are required to comply with their RAG, RAG rating. That is, that they need to go to managed quarantine facilities. Um, if they are returning from an amber or a green country, then uh, the, the restrictions we have for those uh, apply. So, uh, the the approach that has been taken. Since the introduction of the traffic light system has significantly changed some of the early issues that we had for both oil and gas workers and also for uh, for seafarers. Um, however, there are restrictions that remain in place uh, for both groups of workers uh, if they are returning from a red list country uh, for the reasons related to the, the risk assessment that is carried out by the GBC. Okay. Thank you. Um, my second question relates to um, it's actually specifically St. Johnson Football Club travelled to Turkey, played their game and came home. And I have constituents who have property in Turkey who want to go over to properties in Turkey that they have issues to deal with, but are giving <clears throat> the example that elite sports people can travel, but they can't. Um, is there a way for people to travel to uh, Turkey, when it is in the red list, and still have their um, uh, to still do safely, or can you give us a detail as to why it was okay for St Johnston to do it? Not that I'm saying that St Johnston shouldn't have gone, 
Um, <laughs> but uh, they're, 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 the, the complaints from the, the constituents is that this, this is a level of, of hypocrisy. Could you give us some detail as to why that is the case? Well, okay, and it'd be fair to say that St Johnson put a fine performance in when they went to Turkey as well, um, although the end result wasn't the one we were all looking for for them. Uh, before I bring in Professor Jason Leach on this, because he obviously is involved in a lot of the discussions with uh, elite sports organisations, uh, the principal difference here is that clubs which are, or clubs, for example, St Johnston taking part in a, a UEFA competition is that there are uh, quite strict controls imposed by UEFA around clubs that are participating in uh, international or are participating in their competitions. Effectively, they create bubbles uh, for the uh, for the players and those who are supporting the players, and they have a testing regime in place uh, which is associated with that. And part of the uh, part of the ability for us to uh, part of the reason why we're able to give them an exemption is because of the bubble that these international bodies specify for the clubs or sports people who are taking part in these particular events. And on the basis of that, we're then able to uh, provide them with an exemption. But uh, Jason Leach spends a considerable amount of time um, in discussions with uh, international sports bodies around these matters and also our own domestic sports body, and he can maybe explain a bit more uh, on the type of arrangements that they have in place, but it's around the, the bubble which they create for those who are participating in the events, and the uh, nature of their travel to and from these events, uh, which is very different from an individual who is travelling on their own um, uh, to go on holiday, um, uh, or just for business and coming back uh, to, to a country which is on red list. But, uh, I'll let Jason Leach say a wee bit more about what those restrictions are for international events. Uh, Mr Matheson's summary is correct. Uh, there are elite sporting exemptions that are tested and tried for the golf events, for the Formula One, for some football games. They didn't fly domestic. They didn't leave their bubble or their compound. They flew in, played their game, flew out. So it is entirely different, I'm afraid, from individual travel, flying domestically through airports, through everything else on the plane, in any direction, public transport at either end. It's an entirely different concept. They did, though, because it was a red country, have to ask permission. And we looked at all of the details of it, including the team coming the other way, the Turkish team coming here, no away fans, testing, Vaccination, if possible, very, very encouraged to be vaccinated in both directions and uh, private travel in a bubble. Thank you very much. That was pretty much the answer that we gave them, so I'm glad you confirmed it. <laughs> um, my final point is for seasonal agricultural workers. Uh, what are the current uh, restrictions on seasonal agricultural workers coming into the country, uh, and are they adequate? Uh, so the uh, so the restrictions that apply to seasonal ag agricultural workers are, um, uh, are the, the before I bring in I think it'll be Penelope or, or uh, one of the other officials specifically on is Graham Fisher is that they are required to uh, self isolate and that those who are bringing in uh, the seasonal workers have to provide accommodation for them um, uh, which they must self isolate so if they're coming in. Uh, from an amber list country, they're going to have to self-isolate uh, for for the uh, ten days, and also to be tested on day uh, day uh, eight and day sorry day two and day eight if they are unvaccinated. If they're if they are vaccinated, then obviously it's only a test on it's only a test on day two. Uh, so there is a the the requirement is that those who are bringing them in that there's a requirement for them to provide accommodation for them to be able to self-isolate. What then happens is that local health boards and local public health officials are responsible then for managing that with the uh, with the, uh, the 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 company uh, who's bringing them in uh, uh, to to work on a seasonal basis and to make sure that they are complying with the regulations. Uh, that can involve spot checks to make sure that people are self isolating if that's what they're meant to do. 
Uh, alongside that, to have a testing regime in place so that if anyone uh, becomes unwell, is that they have access to testing uh, and are able to be tested, and if necessary, uh, to then require further self-isolation for both them and other individuals that they may be residing with. So there are fairly tight restrictions around those uh, coming in. Uh, for example, some of those who were coming in on flights, they were specifically on to uh, dedicated transport to take them to their accommodation. So they had to make sure that they were being transited to their accommodation if they were self-isolating. Uh, and once they were there, making sure that arrangements were in place for them to self-isolate, again, to uh, minimise the risk of potential importation of the virus and also uh, for that to then be spread to anyone locally. I do not know if um, officials want to say anything more on that, but it was a, a package that was specifically designed to help to support the sector at a, a, a key point during the course of the year. Um, and it was agreed with public health advisors as being proportionate and appropriate to help to manage the risk associated with the importation of uh, the virus. No. <laughs> Thank you. Can I ask Alex Rally? Thank you. Cabinet Secretary, while minimising the risk and the steps that are being taken are, 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 are correct to do so, we recently spoke to public health experts who said that if a variant emerges anywhere in the world for a country short of actually just locking down your borders, that variant is, is, is almost certainly going to get in. And if that's the case, I suppose my question is about giving a false sense of security and should we as countries be demanding to see collective action around the world because what we need to do is stop variants emerging and the way to do that is to vaccinate everyone across the world. What's your view on that? Well, take that in two parts. Um, so the first part is that um, uh, no system is going to be able to uh, stop uh, uh, all variants or variants of concern from being able to enter into the country. What you can do is you can minimise the risk of them. And uh, the purpose behind having a managed quarantine system is that when an individual is tested as being positive, it's prioritised for genomic sequencing, which allows us to very quickly identify whether that may be a variant of concern. So it acts as a process to try and minimise the risk. But you're right to say there is no system other than just stopping people from travelling internationally uh, altogether uh, from uh, avoiding all of the risk, but it's about it's about a proportionate approach to trying to minimise that risk. And the system we have in place, we believe, is a proportionate response to trying to help to minimise that potential risk and to identify variants of concern when they enter the country as quickly as uh, possible. Um, and I should also add that the the RAG rating system. So uh, the, the process that has gone through by the Joint Biosecurity Centre involves looking at data in different countries uh, to identify whether there may be variants of concern circulating, where variants of concern are circulating, and there is community transmission of them, then the likelihood is that they are going to find themselves higher up the RAG rating and most likely in the red category because they then present a potential risk to us. Um, as a result. So it's a proportionate response to try and help to minimise that risk. But I do accept that you, uh, unless you stop all forms of international travel, you are not going to be able to stop um, variants uh, altogether. But I think your second point is absolutely right. Look, while the virus continues to circulate in uh, not just here in Scotland, uh, the UK, or in other parts of the world, uh, the risk of new variants uh, developing it remains high, uh, and that remains an even greater risk in those countries where vaccination levels or access to vaccination has uh, remained very low. So we only have to, uh, you know, from my perspective and from the Scottish government perspective, the outcome we want here is to make sure that countries right across the world have access, fair access to vaccines in order to help to reduce the risk uh, to individuals in those countries as well. But if we do that, we also reduce the potential risk of uh, new variants of concern emerging as well. So, you know, there, there's no point looking at this from the perspective of 
you know, um, so long as we're all right here, Jack, um, everything's fine. Uh, the way to deal with this is on a global basis, and it's essential that all countries across the world play their part in trying to make sure that countries across the world have access to vaccines and to a vaccination programme in order to make sure we're minimising the, uh, the risk of uh, to these countries, but also the, the emergence of uh, new variants of concern. Thank you. And, and can I ask as well, just one final question. Brian talked earlier about uh, opening up international travel. I do wonder, in your role as Cabinet Secretary, do you balance, or is there a balancing act between people walking back to how it was before and the government's policy and consideration of the government's policy on climate? How do you balance that? Because a lot of people would say, why on earth would we want to go back to how it was pre-COVID? Do you mean in relation to um, aviation and, and yeah. climate change? Yeah. Well, the, the, the principal restrictions we have in place just now are, are based upon public health needs, so um, uh, rather than environmental needs. So the, the restrictions that we've had for international travel were to uh, minimise and reduce the risk of variants of concern, as I've uh, mentioned. Now, uh, in relation to climate change and the role that aviation can play in helping to tackle climate change, that's an important issue, um, one which I think the aviation industry have started to address, uh, but they've still got a lot to do uh, in helping to reduce the impact that aviation has on our, our climate. And uh, there's some work we're doing at the Scottish Government level in supporting the industry uh, in order to try to help to support that. Uh, but there's no doubt in my mind that, uh, that uh, we want to reduce the impact aviation has on our climate. I don't think the way to do that, though, is through the public health regulations around international travel, which are specifically there to, to, to manage the risk of, of the, the, the pandemic. Will people's behaviour change in the future? Will folk choose to, uh, will folk choose to um, uh, stay more at home? For their holidays, um, as a result, um, uh, I suppose the question, the answer to that is unknown. Uh, we don't know yet um, whether whether there'll be significant behaviour change in people's uh, uh, travelling patterns, both at a domestic and an international level, where more people choose to make use of trains rather than domestic aviation. Um, uh, again, there's a lot of uncertainty around that. There's been some research carried out into, into it. And it's difficult to know whether some of the behaviour changes we have seen, whether they will be whether they will be sustained going forward. And uh, as I say, globally, well, people's travel behaviours change, and there'll be less international travel uh, uh, for particularly for leisure. Uh, it's difficult to say. Uh, so I think that's a bit of an unknown to you, Mr. Uh, Rowley. But um, uh, I suspect there will be some changes. Was the scale? It's just the, what's not clear is the scale and nature of that on a permanent basis. And just finally, again, in terms of your relationship with the UK government and working on these issues, is there regular contact? Is both governments working closely together? Are you satisfied? Are you happy with the relationship that's there? Well, look, there is um, there is close engagement, and our officials are uh, engaged almost um, on a daily basis in some of these issues. Would I say to you that the relationship across the four nations um, on dealing with some of these issues uh, is satisfactory? I think my answer to that would be is no. Uh, there are times when the UK government have, um, have a, a, a indicated to us a, a desire to change things at very short notice, without meaningful dialogue between not just the Scottish government, but the Northern Irish and the our current counterparts in Northern Ireland and in Wales, uh, which has uh, led us to being in a very difficult situation in, in trying to address some of the issues and concerns that we have about uh, very sudden changes that they intend to make. Um, uh, uh, by and large, the system works OK, but I wouldn't say it's a good system. Uh, there has been a tendency at times for the UK government to uh, seek to make changes at very short notice without engagement with the 
with the other devolved nations, and this is an issue which has been raised with them on a regular basis. Has that adequately been addressed yet? Um, uh, no, it hasn't. Um, and I know that the Deputy First Minister has raised this matter with uh, Michael Gove on a number of occasions, and despite assurances that, uh, for example, ministerial meetings being called at very short notice, um, uh, sometimes quite literally with hours of notice, that there's a, a meeting to discuss some issues around international travel, um, uh, despite having raised those issues in the past, um, uh, it still happens. So, uh, uh, what we're trying to do, Mr. Rowland, what I try to do is I try to make the system work as best I can. So, it does sometimes mean dropping things to take part in meetings at quite literally um, an hour or two's notice in order to engage with UK ministers on changes that they've decided that they're looking to bring forward uh, without uh, giving us forewarning of those. Uh, but I still think there's a lot of work needs to be done in order to make sure that it's a a relationship that uh, that it takes into account the distinctive role that the the different devolved nations have in these policy areas, and to make sure that any planned changes are ones which allow uh, the the devolved nations an opportunity to consider these matters in detail and to then provide feedback before any final decisions are made on the changes that are being made to the international travel regulations. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I'm just conscious of time because I know the Cabinet Secretary does need to be in the chamber shortly. So that concludes our consideration for this agenda item, and I'd like to thank the Cabinet Secretary and the officials for their evidence today. Moving on to agenda item number three, subordinate legislation. I now move to the third agenda item, which is consideration of the motions on the made affirmative instruments considered during the previous agenda item. Cabinet Secretary, would you like to take, make any further remarks on the SSIs before we take the motions? Uh, no further comment, uh, convener. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Are members content for motions S6M-00699, S6M-00697, S6M-00696, S6M-00698, S6M-0027, S6M-0026, S6M-00903, S6M-00833, and S6M-00976 to be moved on block. Thank you. Members have agreed to move the motions on block. I now invite the Cabinet Secretary to move on block motions S6M00699, S6M-00697, S6M-00696, S6M-00698, S6M-00727, S6M00726, S6M-00903, S6M-00833 and S6M-00976. Moved. Moved. Can I invite any comments from members? I note no member has indicated they wish to speak. So I'll now put the question on the motions. The question is that motions S6M-00699 S6M-00697, S6M-00696, S6M-00698, S6M-00727, S6M-00726, S6M-00903, S6M-00833, and S6M-00976 be agreed to. Do members agree? Thank you. The motions are agreed to. The committee will publish a report to the Parliament setting out our decision on the statutory instruments considered at this meeting in due course. That concludes our consideration of this agenda item and our time with the Cabinet Secretary. I'd like to thank the Cabinet Secretary and his supporting officials for their attendance this morning.
The committee's next meeting will be on the 16th of September, when we'll be taking evidence from the Deputy First Minister and the Cabinet Secretary for COVID Recovery on ministerial statement on COVID-19, the Coronavirus Extension and Expiry Scotland Act 2021 reports to the Scottish Parliament and subordinate legislation. That concludes the public part of our meeting this morning. I suspend this meeting to allow the witnesses to leave. <laughs>